at the same time, when I was brought on, one of the things the board and, and even um, the founder had made very clear was that there's this big goal for 2022 that we reach 300,000 children. And at that point, we were at about 20,000. So I'm thinking, okay, we have four years. <laughs> Over the last, and Dignitas had been founded in 2008 and started running its current programming really 2011. So from 2011 to 2017, you've impacted 20,000 odd children. But in the next four years, you want us to do 300,000 <laughs> children. Um, and one of the most difficult things was negotiating some of the changes we wanted to make in the model um, and in how we understood our impact and how we how we built that impact more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And it was challenging because one, I felt the need to negotiate that with the founder. Mm -hmm. um, having been a founder of Seed of Hope, I, I knew what it meant to carry this organization from kind of newborn baby to a fully fledged thing <laughs> and um, how difficult it was to step away as a funder. And I knew that whilst I, well, sorry, step away as a founder. And I knew that whilst a founder shouldn't have an unhealthy grasp on an organization's strategy and direction once they leave, mm -hmm. there's part of their vision that has to kind of stick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's a healthy balance to be struck in understanding and honoring the vision. The original vision. Yes, mm. whilst pursuing perhaps a, a new level or the next stage uh, or even a refined version of that vision mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think we often talk about kind of founder syndrome um, and we talk about many organizations going through very difficult transitions as founders step away and mm. new people step in and, mm. and for many organizations it's a rough couple of years mm. and I think actually we were very blessed not to face that mm -hmm. and I think a part of it is because we had both been founders mm. so we could each approach the journey mm. <laughs> with I think just the right sense of kind of honoring each other, honor, honoring each other, each other's process mm -hmm. um, and recognizing both as a founder that had just stepped away from something and stepping into the shoes of a founder that there are seasons, not mm. only kind of personally career wise, but mm. seasons for organizations. Mm. So mm. when I look at those early years of Dignitas, I think it was very much a season of refining what we do, understanding what we do. Mm. The very early days of Dignitas, the biggest focus was listening to the community. Mm. So understanding from the, the community. The very early days of Dignitas yes. in the previous yes, founder Yes, under the, the founder. Yeah. Um, they spent a huge amount of time simply doing community outreach. Mm -hmm. um, and their aim was to understand from, at that point they were rooted in Mathari, so mm -hmm. to understand from pastors, from community workers, from children's officers, from parents, mm -hmm. from children themselves, What's the biggest issue in your community? Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons Dignitas took the shape that it did is because the response was consistently mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these community owners and stakeholders and actors were saying education is what we need. Mm -hmm. But then when um, our founder um, and her team looked around the community, they saw, but there are schools everywhere. <laughs> so why is education a problem mm -hmm. if there are this proliferation of schools? Mm -hmm. And so it became clear that quality of education Matters. was the challenge, mm. not simply provision. Mm. And so this kind of access versus quality. Mm -hmm. um, and that same kind of reflection is mirrored in the transition from the millennial development goals to, to the, SDGs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where you see that kind of shift from, okay, let's build access mm. to let's actually create quality. Mm -hmm. um, and so Dignitas became about ensuring that quality mm -hmm. um, and so as I say that those first few years of Dignitas were very much about refining that vision understanding that vision mm. considering what quality means what it looks like understanding that workforce are the core of that mm. quality and then focusing mm. our energy on developing the education workforce mm -hmm. and so whilst growth might have seemed very slow over those first few years mm -hmm. I believe it gave us a depth and strength of foundation mm -hmm. that enabled the growth that came in the next season, which mm. was when I, I took on the leadership mm. role and mm. was challenged with this growth. Mm. Um, and so whilst a lot of my negotiation in the, those early days was around what needs to change to allow us to grow. To scale. It was also about honoring that. The, the, the foundation that, yes. <laughs> is important before the scale. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and scaling without thinking about that quality and impact means you're scaling for the sake of numbers. Yeah, so you're yeah. ticking the numbers box. Yeah but the impact is not there. And yeah. we see that sadly so yeah. often in the development sector yeah. Yeah. where I can report 
four thousand people were trained yeah. on any on, particular issue on on no impact. Yeah, yeah, but how did it impact on their lives or yeah. their children's lives? There's or... no quality. There's <laughs> yeah. no yeah, and there's, there's no, no follow substance. through. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's no sustainability exactly. As well. Yeah, so those, those foundational years made yeah. sure we were thinking deeply about mm, impact, mm, mm. Um, and that, to be honest, laid the foundation mm, for the growth. Mm. Um, so there was a negotiation with the founder in that sense of, of what's our vision, mm. what's these first few years been mm, about, and mm. then negotiation with the team, because mm. the team, to some extent, had. I guess they were used to a certain norm. Mm. <laughs> they were a team of 14 supporting 21 schools mm. and they had a relatively easy workload. Mm. <laughs> they also hadn't, hadn't lacked that kind of senior leadership for a year or so. Mm. There was no one really pushing them. Mm. And so there was this sense of we need to change how we do some things. We need to have this negotiation around what changes, what stays, what's important as we grow. Um, and essentially it's a change management process mm -hmm. <laughs> with mm. the team mm. of saying, okay, this is our vision. This is still at the core of who we are and what mm. we do, mm. but we need to rethink how we do it. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, it was costing us um, per year, per child, about $90 mm -hmm. to run our program. Mm -hmm. Today, it costs us about $10 per child per year, between $10 and $12. Mm. How did you bring that down? Um, first, driving efficiency in what we do. Mm -hmm. So simple things like um, clustering our schools geographically and mm -hmm. assigning staff to clusters. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have staff spending a huge amount of time traveling from Madari to Kangemi to Kaungwari instead of assigning one member of staff to Kangemi mm -hmm. and having them work with all the partner schools mm -hmm. there, another one to Kaungwari. So mm -hmm. simple efficiencies like that. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, thinking about if we restructure our program to focus on what makes the most difference, mm -hmm. then we invest our resource in what really works. Mm -hmm. So we had an external evaluation of our work conducted by an organization called ZZ Afrique. Mm. Um, and we asked the question, what is it that makes the biggest difference for children? Mm -hmm. um, and they came back and we had at that point kind of seven pillars in our school partnership mm -hmm. and they highlighted three. Which ones? Um, instructional leadership. So mm -hmm. how a school leader leads instruction and drives the quality mm -hmm. of teaching and mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. Learner engagement. Mm -hmm. How do learners participate in their own learning? Mm -hmm. What's their role? How do we better equip them? Mm -hmm. um, kind of aligned to the, the notion behind CBC of being able to learn to learn. CBC mm -hmm. is another mm. topic altogether. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third one was school and classroom culture. Mm -hmm. So are our schools places where children are happy, safe and valued? Mm -hmm. And so basically we decided these are the three things that make the most different for children in our programs. Mm. Let's invest everything in those three things and do them really well. Mm. And that's essentially what we did. So what was previously a two or three year partnership with a school became a one year partnership that focused on those three things. Mm. So investing resource, both financial and human, where it mattered most, allowed us to drive impact. Mm. 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 At this stage, uh, I'm, I'm curious, just um, this, this uh, evaluation and uh, this evaluation has brought this wonderful insights. Mm. Uh, what do you, what do, you and you choose to respond to the findings of this evaluation by reprogramming or by mm -hmm. restructuring how you do some of these things, which further drives efficiency, mm -hmm. further drives impact, um, uh, further drives also team alignment. Mm -hmm. um, what are you, how, so what What does that look like internally for, for the team? Are mm -hmm. you, are you, the, the 14 of, the 14 of the people who are there is mm -hmm. that the team that you still continue with do that does it mean that you upskill them mm -hmm. you, ch you do a bit of rehiring mm -hmm. what what how does that look like when you talk about change management a bit of all of those mm -hmm. <laughs> so as i say it's a process of negotiation it's mm -hmm. a change management process mm -hmm. because we're whilst we're working towards the same vision mm -hmm. we're changing how they do their jobs day mm -hmm. to day mm -hmm. So one of the ways of driving efficiency was also digitizing some systems. All right. So particularly how we collect data and report in the field, we mm -hmm. tried to digitize all of that. Mm. And surprisingly, there was quite a bit of pushback on that because people are used to doing things certain ways. So part of it is just kind of saying, no, this is why we're doing this. We believe it's the right thing to go, uh, the right way to go. And, and we really just need to make it work. Mm. Now, a big part of that is listening. So listening to why they feel it's not working <laughs> and being able to respond and together find the solution. Um, and 
having that be a shared process. I think that's a big piece. Mm. Um, and that shared process allows us to grow together <laughs> so that we're not steaming ahead and leaving people behind, mm. but we're, we're moving as a, as a team. Mm. Of course, there were people who just felt like that wasn't where they wanted to go. We actually only had one person who resigned through that process and, and she resigned to go and pursue her own project, to found her own thing. Um, it may just have been coincidental timing, um, but of course, I think change is disruptive mm. anyway. And, mm. and I think for anybody who may have already been thinking, maybe it's my time. Mm. Mm. <laughs> if a big change comes, sometimes mm. that's the push they need to mm. actually make that decision one mm. way or the other. Mm. Um, but mostly it was it was kind of rallying the team. Mm, mm. <laughs> um, we spent a lot of time building that vision for growth together mm. and kind of going through those thought processes together. So we'd have quarterly um, team retreat days. Mm -hmm. Now were, we were just in the office, we didn't mm. go anywhere, <laughs> mm. but it was okay, let's put all other work aside and mm. today ask ourselves the hard questions. Mm -hmm. And so as a team, we basically, one of the very first meetings, we sat and did the maths and we said, okay, mm. from 2011 to 2017, we've worked at this pace mm. and we've impacted this many children. Mm -hmm. We have this goal for 2022. How do we get there? Even just simple maths. <laughs> How many schools would we need to partner with over the next four years to achieve that goal? And that in itself being part of their own recognition of, okay, if we keep going the same pace, we're simply never going to get there. <laughs> um, so what needs to change and how do we change the pace of what we're doing? Um, even as we did the, the evaluation, walking with the team bit by bit through those findings and, and seeing together, okay, this is what works. This is what this tells us. This is what this leads us to think about. Um, and I think asking those hard questions mm. together. Um, mm. I think one, don't be afraid to ask hard questions yeah. and, and, and secondly, don't do it alone as a leader. I think mm. sometimes as a leader, you feel like you have to be yeah, the one the with the answers. To, yeah. <laughs> Whereas actually, I think your role as a leader is, is to, to the rally the team yeah. to answer them together yeah. and each bring their own experience mm. and expertise mm -hmm. to, to those answers. Mm. And I think the other thing mm -hmm. um, that we did over that season, mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't know who said this originally, mm. um, but advice that was given to me was don't focus on your solution, focus mm -hmm. on a problem. Mm. So if you focus on the solution, you're kind of sold out to the wrong thing. And as mm. things change and as something like a pandemic comes mm. along, mm. the solution mm. might be completely irrelevant. Mm. But mm. if you focus on the problem, mm. you'll always be designing in response to, to, to that. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. So, so in that season, it was again, going deeper as, as a team understanding, mm. is the problem mm. what we found it to be in 2008 to mm. 2011? Has mm. it shifted? Has it changed? Mm. Mm. And what are the new dynamics mm. brought about Around. by CBC and yeah. other changes within the education sector? Yeah. And how should we be mm. crafting our solution in response mm. to those? Mm. Mm.